Hello, everyone. Welcome back and good morning to our friends in Australia and New Zealand. Um, really appreciate you guys doing this. I was just telling you guys on the phone that um, we just in the US right now, we've had very little visibility into your markets um, that we normally are able to watch you guys a little bit. I think because we're enamored by the countries anyway, but um, I I also thought it would be super interesting to just get outside of our heads for a second and talk to people who might be coming on the other side of this and feeling a little bit more optimistic about where we're headed. So first of all, since I actually, I don't know all of your backgrounds, I was wondering if maybe we could just introduce ourselves. Um, Pete, do you mind um, starting with this and just telling me a little bit about when, how you started the company and how where you are and how long you've been there? Sure, perfect. Yeah, so so we started this business. Um, it was an accidental business. I think a lot of us in the industry, you know, come from come from this accidental. Uh, we had a little cabin in the woods, and uh, and we just decided that we'd start managing it. And and um, and today we're around about 150 properties. Um, it's um, you know we started getting serious about the business. I think about six or eight years ago. Um, and um, and it's just been a, a, an incredible ride. Um, we really love it. We we love the people. We we uh, we love the industry. We love being part of the of uh, the BRM Intel family and, and the Burma family for that matter. Um, and uh, and coming to the conferences in the states. So um, so yes, it's, it's been amazing, and um, I'm really excited to be to be part of the panel today. Oh, I'm glad you're here, um, Leslie. Uh, we got to meet, uh, spend some time with Leslie at the Women's Summit last year. Excellent. I am Leslie. I started a business, uh, Batch Care Holiday Homes in New Zealand, which is nationwide. Um, I sold the business last year to Sykes Holiday Colleges in the UK. Uh, stepped down as CEO at the end of the year in December. Um, so sit here uh, close to the New Zealand market, but a little bit removed from the day to day. So I guess I can offer probably a little bit more of an independent perspective at the moment. Rebecca, I actually don't know how you got started. Good morning. Uh, so yes. I was a full acting real estate agent um, from about 2006 until 2012. And someone walked into my office and said, I want to buy a house, but I don't want to live in it. Um, and I don't want to rent it out because I just want to go when I feel like it. Can you holiday rent it for me? And that's how our business started. That's close to seven years ago, seven years in October. We now look after 330. Well, it might be a little less now because of the plethora of people thinking that they're going to get a permanent tenant in this environment. Um, but about 330 properties. I've got 22 staff in um, two specific areas, really. The south coast of New South Wales, which was just recently very heavily hit by the bushfires, which I think you guys heard a lot about. So we're back to back natural and um, pandemic, natural disaster and pandemic all in the one year. So that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, but I too, like Pete, love the industry, um, love attending the Verma conferences, I'm booked for your conference or the, the ladies conference in in um, February. I'm also booked to come to the data conference in August. I don't think I'll be there. Um, but I don't think we'll be there either, but they're trying to see us over so we'll find out. <laughs> we're, we're in a what? Yeah, I mean, we can't get a refund either. I mean, so it's like, you know, you think about the whole refund policy and events yeah. are not refunding. So like we're on the hook for 150 grand at the Gaylord wow. in Denver for the data conference. So if you don't see VRM Intel again, it's because of that. No, <laughs> no. We brand it. We'll call it something. We'll call it holiday Intel. <laughs> oh wow, that's interesting that you say that the events are not um not cancelling you. Maybe we will come back to that. But anyway, Burma yeah, and the American conference yeah, yeah, have ahead. really taught me to be a better operator in Australia. So. I've enjoyed them very much. Karen, how'd you get started? Yeah, also by accident. So I, I had a different startup back then and had to reduce my, my cash burn privately. And um, that was about five years ago now. And I put my, my place up to rent it out um, whilst I was uh, away. And uh, that sounded easy, but it wasn't. And um, um, and yeah, and the May Comfy was born and when uh, my co-founder Sabrina helped me and around as of four years ago we launched what we do now sort of um, urban short-term rentals we've got around um, a bit more than 600 properties across australia 
mainly in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra. And uh, yeah, we are a team of a bit over 100. Um, and um, yeah, uh, sort of uh, like what Rebecca said, then we had the bushfires, then, then some of our properties, the floods, and uh, now the pandemic, it's sort of, if anyone told us that before, how likely that is to happen, I think we all would have put a lot of money on that, that it doesn't happen in a row, but uh, within a month or two. Um, but yeah, um, um, it's, I guess, like all of us, I'm trying to get through this and um, seeing how does the world and our industry look like uh, when the pandemic is uh, uh, getting to a bit of an um, end. Um, so the the fire combo with the pandemic is is obviously just shocking. I mean, that being said, we've been looking over here and we're going into hurricane season next month um, for a lot of our Atlantic and Gulf Coast, you know, hurricane. Now, granted that we would never see one until July or August or September, but, you know, it's somebody's going to, I mean, it, it's hard to go a year without somebody getting hit. So you have, I mean, so there, there are some destinations who are going to have what you've had, one on top of another. Um, have you seen businesses um, fall out in your area that could not make it through both of those events? Rebecca, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I did. I saw a local competitor in Wollongong. They may managed maybe 24 properties and they've gone um just shut the doors and rang their owners and said, we just can't do this anymore. And Wollongong wasn't that hit by the bushfires. So it was obviously they were under pressure to start with and then people didn't or couldn't travel and perhaps they were um, not as tough as you need to be. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes you have to be a little bit tough to get through these things and they didn't handle it. So sad, but true. Yeah, I've seen someone close their business. Yeah, and um, Pete, you actually wrote in a comment to me that I thought was interesting. You said um, that the Australia and New Zealand holiday markets are coming out of this a lot quicker than the USA and Europe. Our crisis phase has abated, for now at least, and the curve has flattened out dramatically, giving us a chance to look at and plan for what a reopening might look like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What does reopening look like? We don't really know yet. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's 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 something we're talking a lot about together as as a as a group. There's a, a few support groups that we've got set up where we're um, you know we we think that uh, reopening might possibly look like July, um, and uh, and and that will be pretty much somewhere between 90 and, and 110 days from from when the first flare went in the air to say that this was going to be a bad thing. So, so we, we're kind of hoping for a, a slow release um, in about July. Uh, our curve has flattened dramatically. We're really not getting very many infections at all now. Um, so I think in that sense, we're maybe 30 days possibly ahead of where folks are in the States. Um, and, uh, and, but um, you know, this thing, this thing has a, <laughs> the tail has a lot of uh, a lashes on it, I, su I suppose. And, but, but a reopening, a, a soft reopening, perhaps Kieran and I were talking about this last night, that perhaps the regional areas, the more holiday destinations may start to free up a little bit more and we may start to get a bit more traffic in those areas before perhaps the the, uh, the, the urban areas. Um, but um, we're kind of hoping for, uh, for a July 1 opening, but we're preparing for a September, October uh, reopening. So that's still pretty yeah, far out. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Leslie, is that the maybe, to... Go ahead, Karen. Maybe just to add on that, I think what, what, what the government here has been doing since the beginning, always talking about six month terms and not so much in weeks. So I would really prepare everyone here to to um, uh, to to budget and to plan uh in in longer in longer uh spins and uh the support programs have also been around that so when pete talks now about july that sounds fast very positive but maybe for you guys um a, a bit far out but it's um i think here in both countries we still have the opportunity to eradicate the virus um and in that strategy i think it's crucial to to write off april and may and um, simply plan what is um after that but then 
um, really focusing on our strong domestic markets and um, combining New Zealand and uh, uh, Australia. This is where the opportunity lies and uh, where um, everyone is currently uh, focusing at, uh, including the government. Was there New Zealand and Australia on the same timelines? Yeah, they are. Um, New Zealand is likely to come out of, of what we're calling level four in the next couple of weeks, but we're going to go into a level three, which is a, um, a framework just introduced in New Zealand, like Australia, to get the country accustomed and used to what's happening. So there's a lot of forward communication. It's highly unlikely our level three uh, will allow any travel. Uh, it has indicated there's no travel. We don't know what will happen on level two. They haven't communicated when we're going into level three or how long it will be, but a lot of the government projections are a couple of months. Um, so I think Pete's timeframes are spot on. Um, the difference we have here is that it's the winter markets. Uh, we go into the winter time now. So in terms of any real volume, it won't pick up again until October, which will be our labor weekend, and then the summer season in December. Um, the ski fields, Queenstown is decimated. Uh, most of the Queenstown market is an international market, and it was at 50% occupancy in February this year when the Chinese market was cut off when we shut the borders to China. Um, and now we've obviously shut the borders to Australia, which is the other big market uh, for Queenstown. So it's questionable whether there'll be a ski season, even if the mountains do open. Uh, the North Island ski fields as well are pretty popular. Uh, they haven't been able, obviously, to do any maintenance in the area. So they're talking about if there is a ski season, it'll be a very different ski season. And so maybe there'll be some movements in July, August in the winter markets, but it's not going to be much volume. Um, and to, to Kieran's point, we are talking about bubbles in New Zealand and Australia, and there is talk about given both countries are going for an eradication rather than a, um, just containing whether we can open up to a trans-Tasman. Um, we're 50% of each other's international markets. In New Zealand, we're 50% international, 50% domestic. If we open up Australia and China, that's 60% of our international market. But the caution still is in our country, don't expect that this year. In 2020? Yep. Um, is there enough local business, is there enough business, domestic business, to keep these companies open and to keep your tourist areas open? Yeah, I think each of us has a, a slightly different, probably, answer to that. Um, I, I think for us, when things reopen, um, uh, domestic is probably about 80 to 90 percent of our business anyway. Um, so we're kind of excited actually to see what the, the back end of this year might look like because we're not going to see any, any international people traveling internationally from Australia um, unless they go to New Zealand, so to Leslie's point. Um, and um, so, so I think people will want to travel domestically. They're certainly not going to go on cruises. You know, that's that's uh, you know a taboo subject, I think, now for down under. Um, so, so I think the domestic uh, traveler is going to be looking for a holiday because they've been stuck at home all this time. Um, if they've still got a job, they've, they've still got some money and the government's doing a pretty good job of keeping the economy ticking along. Um, so so we have, we're kind of excited that um, that sort of October, that spring into summer period for us, which is October, uh, November, December, um, could be massive and it could be our biggest and, and best ever. You know, we've just got to get through this uh, horrible, you know, four to six month period. When you look at, um... I'll wait on that. The government thing. So we have had um, we, the unemployment rate is skyrocketing here. We have layoffs, furloughs. Um, we have businesses who don't know if they're going to make it through this. Like this is um, economically, it, it feels like economically here it's more of a disaster than it is in other places. Um, how are your government handling this for your employees and your businesses? So maybe I can answer a little bit on that, um, um, given we have quite a few um, uh, employees and we went through a lot of this. Um, what what the government, and I'm usually quite critical to the government, <clears throat> but what I've done here really well is um, communicating very early um, that it is going to be a six month period. And then um, they've launched initiatives um, that enable businesses to keep employees and also to reduce their fixed costs, like your rent and um, and other things and uh, making it more of a variable cost and that enabled us to 
to reduce, um, um, for example, our team hours in a, in a way um, that we didn't have to do uh, any layoffs. Um, we um, have a combination of uh, of uh, more reduced hours, um, of um, using people for, for for different tasks and things like that. And um, yeah, and um, we also had a few support programs that are um, coming um, and already are hitting us uh, 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 April, May. So that gives us a lot to to uh, do something, um, not to do layoffs and not to um, uh, only focus on survival, but to understand, okay, how do we get through, of, through this um, as a team, um, keep um, all the trained um, people uh, on the books and really have everyone focus on how does the business look like um, after this. So for example, compared to uh, uh, Pete's uh, business, um, where I agree it's going to be uh, incredible um, when the uh, domestic travel is allowed again. And we do a little bit on that. Australia banned all the international travel and um, they communicated that will not be opening up until the end of the year, uh, very likely. So any Australian is sort of um, stuck to Australia and um, potentially New Zealand uh, later on. But um, that's a great for, for Pete for us. Um, we are more the urban market. We've been looking very, very early how does um, my country potentially look like. And, uh, and that's been our full focus um, since uh, a month now. How do we change? How do we evolve? And um, how do we become uh, an accommodation uh, choice for certain types that are not international uh, guests? So far, 50% of the guests were international, and we knew we had to replace that uh, no matter uh, uh, what uh, to get through that. But uh, to combine that, the government has been um, really incredible here to, to give us that breathing space to do that. Uh, Can I just add to that, Amy? Um, mm -hmm. Just to give it some sort, of, um, some sort of understanding, the government is paying employers about 20% or a bit more, 25% above the um, the wage that you get if you're unemployed. So we obviously get unemployment benefits in Australia and they're paying each employer for their employees with a few guidelines about 25% above the, that wage for every um, full-time employee, part-time employee yeah. and um, also casuals who have been employed for longer than 12 months, provided that your revenue has reduced as an organisation by more than 30%. So I think the Australian government are amazing. And, you know, perhaps that sort of information is something that can be taken to your powers that be um, as an example of how to keep businesses in operation. We've also been gifted um, if you're a reasonable size employer, employer $100,000 to help us pay our bills. Um, our rents have been legally reduced by 50% for a couple of months um, and then the ability to be able to pay it off over a period of time. Um, they've stopped, um, the government has stopped evictions for tenants that are living in residential rentals. <laughs> There's a six month moratorium, so your landlord can't throw you out. There's many, many more things. The st our state governments are giving grants of $10,000 just to help small businesses that don't have a large payroll. Um, I take my hat off to them. We're really being yeah. helped and my business will survive um, but and would have without those grants, but my staff wouldn't have had jobs and they've all got jobs and they can feel secure that those payments, you know, if you're more, and the mortgage companies have been told to give six months or up to six months moratorium on mortgage payments. <clears> so, you know, my staff can probably live on that 750 Australian dollars a week um, because they don't have to pay their full mortgages that, you know, everybody's, it's very quiet. There's not much to spend your money on. Um, and accordingly, I can keep them in a job, which is absolutely amazing. And my, you know, it's it's emotional for us because I would have had to stand down 22 people and that means 22 families and, you know, 22 lots of children. And it just, the government has done an amazing job. Hats off to them, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that that's been the, the biggest, you know, problem here is that we, I mean, these immediately 
you know, once people looked at their cash flow, you know, and looked at the timeline, the expected timeline, they were like, there's no way. And so mm-hmm. it has been incredibly emotional. And it's been pretty upsetting in our industry. I, I, do, I don't think we yet know what kind of a toll that's going to take on the employee base of the vacation rental industry. Before going into this, those employees were not easy to find. So mm-hmm. you had a lot of people living in tourist areas and, um, you know, the pool of, of employees was high. So these people could move away. I mean, you know, they, they don't have to stay in a beach no. area or a mountain area where they can't make a living. Um, in New Zealand, is it the same way? Are the governments yeah. uh, taking care of the businesses? New Zealand and Australia have a closer relationship, so a lot of the programs match on both sides of the Tasman. Uh, the Australia one's a little bit uh, richer, uh, but it's still the same philosophy. So there's a, a fortnightly payment for each employees. If you can guarantee a reasonable good faith to keep the employees for the duration of the three months at 80% of the current salary, so there's a lot of companies that have reduced hours and reduced salary. Even the government has taken a 20% pay cut. Uh, the prime minister and all the ministers, uh, all the CEOs of all the state-owned companies announced yesterday, they're all standing in solidarity with businesses and reducing their wages by 20% for a six-month period. Um, there's been a lot of coordination with banks, and it's most of our banks are owned by Australian banks. Uh, they have worked in conjunction with the government for these six-month mortgage holidays as well, plus the government is backing loans up to half a million for businesses, small businesses, and they're guaranteeing 80% of the risk of those businesses. So the credit here and the money flow is is phenomenal. We've had several calls from our bankers making sure we're, we're okay. Do we need any funding? Um, do you need any more money? Yeah, yeah, we've had several calls and uh, yeah, it's it's incredible. The I sent to Amy uh, an email that I got from one of our banks um, just as a sense of where the New Zealand um, um, ecosystem is and it is all coordinated and Australia is the same thing, just even more generous in that area. The one difference with Australia and New Zealand is uh, New Zealand is more reliant on tourism. It is our number one export earner and our number one job earner. So I think the impacts will be more felt economically here. We are shut completely where Australia has a lot still open. Um, manu- everything is shut down here except for essential services. Um, manufacturing is shut, construction shut, everything is shut down. And I think it'll take longer to turn the tap back on because I think more people will be economically impacted. We're not as wealthy a country either and the disposable income isn't as great. And um, so it's going to take a little bit more time. Um, looking at your, I was oh, this probably negates the, cancellation question cancellation policies have been a real big issue here but if you're being taken care of in the business then you don't have to worry about holding refunds is that so you've just been refunding um no, for any booking no, no. Not. okay I so how, how are you have a different approach maybe mm-hmm. well pete how are you handling cancellation policies sure. um we've been quite uh firmly pushing for uh date change uh, relocations within 12 months and uh, and with with all the platforms uh, have been pretty well supportive of that, with the, except for Airbnb, as we all know, Airbnb have taken a totally different approach there, and that's uh, that's that's hurt. Um, but uh, but that's just the way it is. Um, but we've uh, we've managed to save about 75 to 80 percent of our bookings, um, and be, and being able to push those into into forward dates, um, and and that's just been a conversation by conversation, person by person email by email and uh, so I'm really happy that, that we've, when we come out of this we've kind of got a war chest now that we can as soon as that tap goes back on people can start filling those holes and booking and and it'll, it'll give us a fast start to be able to, to really get rolling again. It's a little okay, how- different. Okay, no go ahead Leslie. It's a little different in New Zealand. Um, our Commerce Commission just issued a guidelines yesterday on refunds. There's been a lot of complaints to the Commerce Commission and we have quite strong consumer laws and we've got something called the Fair Trading Act. And the commission has has come out yesterday to say, if the T's and C's of the company uh, at the time were a cash refund, you're in breach of the Fair Trading Act if you don't issue a cash refund and you can be prosecuted under the Fair Trading Act. 
So it all is governed by what your T's and C's were in place at the time, and you're not allowed to retrospectively adjust your T's and C's. So whatever was in place when you made the booking has to go I mean, what were the, the standard terms and conditions for cancellations? Uh, in for batch care uh, at the time it was refund. So I believe they're they're doing a combination of if they can move dates they will. If they can issue a credit they will. Um, but they're also issuing cash refunds as well. Are you guys still taking bookings? A few little ones <laughs> here and there. Kieran's got Kieran's got a great story to tell, but I think Rebecca's also got a great story to tell about cancellations and, and how you've handled that as well. Oh, have I, Pete? <laughs> no, I think so. I don't know. Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, oh, do I have to? Um, so I, Everybody else has done it all day. You're good. <laughs> I, took the, I took the hard bitch face stance and just went, sorry, you can't cancel. You can only change your dates and we're going to charge our cancellation fee. Um, move book, sorry, move booking fee. So we, yeah, we've made a little bit of money out of moving bookings. 95% of people, or well, 90% of people have paid the move booking fee. Um, we've transferred a lot of them forward um, and moved their dates. We've had 1,200 cancellations with the value of just over 2 million Australian dollars. Um, so 1,200 moves with a just value just over two million. So it's been fairly heavy duty. Um, and that they're just we've just cancelled April and May. That's all we're or and the end of March, end of March, April and May. But I've been hard and I've just gone. You know what? We take 10,000 bookings a year. If a hundred people hate me, well, you know they'll all have forgotten about it by Christmas when they go on their holidays and. My, my business will still exist and my staff will still have jobs and you know it's a small price to pay to keep our business alive and people in their jobs and you know my my 22 doesn't include 60 cleaners that I that I employ and pay and keep in a job or you know the three laundries that run complete businesses almost based on our laundry so to stay in business was my number one priority and without wanting to be too harsh i you know took a stance that helped us to do that and so be it karen how are you handling it yeah so we um made a pretty tough call in middle of march when sort of the first restrictions came here to australia um we have been growing quite strongly, um, in about 150% year on year. So we focus a lot on property acquisition. Um, we've uh, stopped all that um, um, in the second week of March and um, focused at 100% on um, targeting those that we thought would um, require um, our type of accommodation. Um, and that's been back then uh, businesses and then service workers after that. And uh, by doing that, um, we've called any hospital that is out there, any kind of aged care facility, any kind of health provider. We knew we know they're still operating. Um, you've got a lot, lot of associations that still um, help their members to uh, travel and provide accommodation, and we knew that they will continue to do that. So we've been doing that, and um, we've been so sort of um, successful that we still have occupancy rates of from um, uh, 40 to 55 percent. And we still get bookings um, from that. Um, on top of that, we also have a lot of um, stranded um, people here in Australia that um, are not living here and plan to move back to the country, but currently can't because there are no flights. And um, that's another market that we sort of um, looked at and been able to to fill. Um, now, currently, we have sort of that kind of uh, dilemma that we have very low infection rate, which is fantastic, but it sort of restricts the number of service workers traveling as well. Um, we only have um, it's now below 70 people in ICUs, which is uh, amazing. Um, but of course, it means a lot of empty hospitals. And um, currently, we just need to see what is that next um, uh, that next type of traveler. Is it going to be service workers again, or is it uh, going to be businesses, or is it going to be local? 
um, leisure travelers. And that's sort of where we really try to focus on understanding what is that uh, next target market of us and how do we um, uh, sort of market to those. So do you um, state on that topic, the traveler behavior, trying to, you know, you said, identify that next sector of where the business is coming from. Do you think that travel behavior has changed, has transformed, um, or do you think this is a temporary, um, radically local view that we're going to be having this year and then people will spread back out again? Or do you think that we're going to see more nationalism, localism? Um, from a traveler behavior standpoint. From, from Zealand, my perspective, oh, no, you, you, Leslie. In New Zealand, because we're so heavy uh, international, the predictions are international travel in 2021 will be half of what it was in 2019. Um, so it's going to take a while. Yeah. What's that? In next year, 2021. 2021. So it'll take another year to get to half the volume we were on an international market, which is 50% of travel in New Zealand. Uh, I, th I think there will be a lot of nationalism. Uh, we are far away. Both of us are far away. Our nearest markets, even into Asia, is still a 12 hour flight um, for us. China may come back uh, quickly, but I don't think anyone's going to be in any rush to fly overseas. And there will be a lot of work in, the, in both of our countries where they're playing on the home patriotism to travel locally and to shore up the local domestic markets, but it won't be at the volumes that it was. Yeah, I, I, I think there will be definitely an impact um, um, on the international market in general. Um, also, people will have less disposable income um, this year and next year um, by simply having higher unemployment rates across the world. Um, and I think it's really to um, understand and not wait for that. Um, I talked yesterday with a Peter about a book uh, called Who Moved by Cheese? And um, that's a book I um, read 10 years ago. And it was so clear in front of me that that cheese mountain is is no longer as big or gone for a while. And uh, um, we need to find that next source of, um, of, of, uh, of, of cheese, or in this case for us, uh, um, bookers and travelers. And, um, they might be different, and we might have to activate a few. We might get the support of the government for um, uh, for that, but we uh, I think can't just wait. We have to be proactive on that. And um, for each of us, it's a bit different. So we all have different markets and different um, uh, property owners as well, different guests and things like that. So it's uh, really crucial to look at that and and understand how what is um, what is it that you are unique at, what is it that you're good at. And how can you use that to get a different type of traveler? And um, and uh, yeah, it look, might look different for uh, all of us, um, but it's very important, I think, to be very very uh, honest about that. That that um, what Leslie said, um, there is going to be an impact of the old type of traveler, and we don't know yet how that behavior of Australians and and New Zealanders is changing in regards to what the ability is to travel. Um, so in regards of pricing and things like that, there might be things we will have to be open as well to not have those rates back that we had uh, four months ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's been interesting, Pete. You've actually watched this nationalism trend before coronavirus. Uh -huh. What do you do? You think this is not just coronavirus, but this is a, a very nationalist trend across the world? Yeah, yeah. Look, I think there is definitely, and and you know, we started seeing this on the on the back end of, of our bushfire season, our wildfire season. The government uh, really got in behind our state governments and our, and our national governments really got in behind getting people to travel again, and they they ran some promotions like Stay Here This Year, for example, um, which was phenomenal. And when we the start of Ma of March for us was incredible. The first fourteen days of March. Even though we're, we're we're coming into the to the, the coronavirus issues, um, we're just off the chart incredible as far as forward bookings because people are coming off the bushfires. They're feeling like they need a holiday. They're wanting to travel locally, and it just went crazy. And then on the 15th of March, we fell off the cliff. Like we absolutely fell off the cliff. But it gave me a glimpse into our future that that there's people that are feeling really patriotic. 
they're wanting to stay locally. They're wanting to support the little, uh, the regional and the and the local economies that are out there. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I think it's. Uh, and, and by the way, this is just this is an accommodation. You know, the, the people are going crazy at the moment about making sure we start buying a lot, a building, and buying a lot more Australian-made, Australian-owned produce. I think you're seeing a lot of this, Amy, in the states at the moment, and I, and perhaps around the world. You know, people are starting to think a little bit more about, you know, how can we be a little bit more independent, and how can we make sure that we're putting money into our own economies before we're putting money into somebody else's economy. Yeah, I think in the UK, um, they're actually already marketing for that in the vacation rentals. Oh, okay. well. They're already saying when you can travel, travel, travel Brit, you know, and I think it's really, of course, they were already ahead of that national trend, nationalist trend, you know, mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but I do think it's fascinating to watch how the politics is combining with this event to create this, this new normal. Um, Rebecca, I have a question about the property types. They're looking at houses versus condos versus apartments. Like, have you looked at what property types might be more, um, might fare better than others? Not really, because my market, Amy, is mostly houses. So I'm in myself and Peter in regional areas. Kieran's in the, the urban areas of Sydney. So. We really, my average house is four bedrooms, two bathrooms, um, and attracts couples or families, really. And that market, I mean, I don't know whether you're aware, but we can't even travel up the road to stay half an hour away. We've got to stay in our own houses. Um, I, I have a holiday house on the beach and I'm not allowed to go there. It's my house, and I'm not allowed to go there. Will it be July that you before you're able to? Is that what you're thinking? Um, I look. I think it. I think it'll come back. I think it'll be July that we'll be able to travel domestically. We may be able to travel interstate before July, so within our own state. So we're all well. The three of us are based in New South Wales, which is the biggest state. It also had the most cases of coronavirus and the most death, deaths, but it's being handled very well and I'm not into the statistics, so I'd hand over to one of the other guys for that. But um, maybe we'll be able to travel intrastate first before we're allowed to cross the, the state borders. It remains to be seen, but I, I'm hoping, I'm trying to stay positive that we'll all be back and able to travel on the 1st of July. Bring on 2021 financial year. Um, Leslie, is it the same in New Zealand? Are you? I mean, are your beaches closed? Your, I mean, every public area. Yeah, there's no. Houses? There's. They, uh, it's only essential travel. Um, the police are out in force patrolling. Um, they're now issuing breaches, and there can be instant fines. Uh, on a daily basis, the prime minister and the director general of health are on TV at one o'clock, uh, issuing the stats to the nation. So they report on a daily basis how many breaches there have been, how many notices have been issued, and we have put people in jail for breaches already um, in place. So it is uh, over Easter weekend, there are lots of messages about don't go to your batch, uh, as it's called here, for Easter weekend. And there were roadblocks put in place in certain areas. Not everyone listened to it. Um, but certainly you're not allowed to go to your holiday home. You're not allowed to go in your boat. Um, they've made that clear for level three. Both of those will still be in place. Um, and what we're trying to do with both countries is eradicate. So we're, the countries are both willing to endure pain for the greater good of the nation. And there is this amazing sense of patriotism. And my, it, it's quite hard, I think, in the States to to see what some of these smaller countries are doing, but the the amount of the willingness of the people to go for the greater good of the country, particularly in New Zealand, is incredible. And I think mm -hmm. the the companies that come through the other end will come out incredibly strong. And I sit on the sidelines um, watching Batch Care and thinking there are so many opportunities that will come out if you get through the other end. That it's it's it, as long as you're forward thinking and you can get through the next couple of months, there's some amazing opportunities. Um, in New Zealand, the Minister of Tourism has um, charged the uh, Tourism New Zealand with coming up with a new plan for tourism, how tourism looks in New Zealand. 
So it's a very unified front, um, and they're looking at how we can reimagine tourism in the new reality. Uh, I was on a webinar last uh, a couple of days ago that Tourism New Zealand had, and there were over 2,000 people on the webinar, just Tourism New Zealand, the Minister of Tourism and the Head of Revenue for Air New Zealand, just talking about the, the process the country is going to go through and the industry to work together to reimagine what is possible. Um, and I think that's what happens when you have strong leadership and in a, in a country that is a bit forward thinking. Well, you've lived here before. <laughs> Yes, I have. Yeah, to compare because I know it's not about the U.S., but it's hard not to. Like when you see what's going on here, what do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I had to make a mad dash to the states the first week in March. Um, my mother was not well, or was actually trying to see her before she passed away. Um, and then the six days, and I was in the epicenter. I was in New York and then uh, New Jersey, and then I went to Manhattan. Um, and it, it was amazing in the six days the transition and the transformation. Um, but I think a lot of people still have their head buried in the sand it's coming out but the problem the u.s has is just the lack of leadership and i think it just plays at so many different levels and when you 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 know with the state and the federal system it makes it even more complicated but the lack of leadership starting from the top makes this an incredibly challenging situation um, our daughter goes to this to university her college in the states and we're saying to her um next year which will be her senior year you may have to defer because we're not going to send you back and i just cannot see the U.S. opening up in the fall even um, for when all the universities come back and I see a lot of the universities are, are, there's a few BU has just come out saying it's highly unlikely they'll have first semester back on campus uh, planned for January 2021 before you're back on campus so uh, everyone's making their own decisions in the absence of any federal leadership which is sad oh, I think we we get told things on a two-week basis you know like we're going to close for two weeks and then we'll reevaluate. So we don't have this July or September or August, September expectation, you know, so it's kind of just a constant, you know, pushing, like kicking the can a little bit further, a little bit further without us really knowing what's going on. Pete, you've been watching our politics a little bit. Uh -huh. um, what, why can't we get it together? <laughs> Yeah, look, it's it's really frustrating for us to see what's going on over there, and and um, you know, I think our our red and our and our blue are, are united, and um, and this has really united the country like never before. I think politics is actually a non-issue for the first time in my living memory that people aren't thinking about, you know, conservative Republican. They're just thinking about how can we make this country, you know, get through this, which is really encouraging for me. Rebecca and I sit on the opposite sides of politics and, and we love having these sort of discussions, but you know what, we're absolutely united on this. Um, and, um, and, uh, and I mean, your governor of California, for example, said yesterday that we know sporting events in California until 2021. You know, so there's a few of your governors, I think. The guy in, in Michigan, I think, said yesterday, um, I think he was talking a, a little bit long term. So I think a few of your governors are really getting the memo on this. And they're starting to, uh, you know, to think a bit more long term. Um, but um, yeah, I, I concur with what Leslie says. You, you, you're just not having anybody at the top right now who's who's telling people the reality of it. And the reality is, it's going to be a it's going to be a slow burn. When nobody's going to be going back next week, next month, it's it's just going to take a long time. And if um, you know, I've, 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 I've got a lot to say about that, but I've been, I don't want to be preachy either to, to my American friends because you, know, you guys have got a lot of challenges there. But um, you know, I think the, the governor's perhaps is your way out of this because there's a lot of those guys that are mobilising right now and, and thinking progressively. And um, I'm kind of hoping that, um, that you know, they take a, a stronger leadership role. Rebecca, so you are opposed to Pete politically, but you feel the same way on this. <laughs> yes, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, we're opposed in a lot of ways, um, but we're also, <laughs> um, we're also, you know, confident that I think actually what's happened, and correct me if I'm wrong, Pete, is that both parties in Australia have actually worked together mm. solidly to make sure that everything that they're doing can be passed in legislation before they actually put it to legislation yep. in the Senate. Um, so that's unprecedented. You know, that doesn't happen normally. They battle it out and then one side goes, well, we're just going to put it and hope that we get the right number of votes. But I think it's actually coming from a 
point of agreement, which means that the whole process to actually make things happen is happening quickly because both sides agree. And that's that's amazing. You know, and Australia, you know, I, I don't know whether we've mentioned it, but um, Leslie said, you know, all of their manufacturing is shut down, all of their retail is shut down. We don't have that in Australia. You can still go to work if you're in manufacturing. Uh, many of the retail um, outlets are still open. Um, yep. Some of them have chosen to shut um, themselves, which I, I find is, is interesting. Um, um, you know, you, there's plenty of places that are still open. Like I'm just, I'm settling on a new house today, <laughs> myself personally, and I, which is an interesting timing. I bought it just <laughs> after the, um, just just before I exchanged contracts just before the 14th of March um, when coronavirus hit our country big time. Um, and I can go, I'm going on Saturday to Sydney. I've rung and got some advice. I need to buy things for my house and I'm allowed to do it. So um, it's it's interesting. And yet we're still ahead of the ahead of the game in many, many regards. You know, most people, we've got very, very strict social distancing. All the shops have um, implemented and put signage on the floor where you can stand. They won't mm. let in a certain amount of people. There's, you know, they've got met a number of people. They've got people standing on the door with hand sanitizer. It's been an interesting management. People, like Leslie has said, in New Zealand, but also in Australia, have really banded together um, to actually make sure that this is going to be okay. And you know, they're talking about this social distancing, which I'd like to call physical distancing, because I'm, you know, I'm most concerned about people with mental health problems and the lack of socialisation that's happening um, uh, everywhere. But um, so if we call it physical distancing, we're seeing that, that um, the government announced yesterday that that will stay in place until such time as there's a vaccine. So even if we do travel, we will still be required to sit 1.5 metres away, stand 1.5 metres away until such time as there's a vaccine, which is interesting. Hey, do you think that we'll go to conferences and hug again? I'll be Thanks. hugging you, girlfriend, when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> you wait for it, absolutely. <laughs> yesterday, I had a girlfriend in the street run up and hug me. She said, I'm so touched, Dav, I don't care if I get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> and someone said, you guys are going to get in trouble. And she said, oh, I don't care. She just absolutely needed touch. It's an interesting thing, isn't it, if you're not in a partnership, and you're not, you know, you haven't got anybody to hold on to you. We're used to hugging and kissing. And Pete and I, we're such huggers and kisses, Pete, that we, we, we do. And then I <laughs> and stop my control, you know, take control of myself. I definitely will get back to it. I'm. We have to. The world, you know, needs love and and touch. I mean, maybe just uh, to add on that, um, I agree on that um, touch and love uh, thing. And I'm glad I'm not single. Um, otherwise, it would be really difficult, I think. Um, but um, what, I, what, what I think is remarkable in, in Australia is um, our prime minister, which is like your president, um, the head of uh, the country, did really, really poorly with the bushfires. And uh, I think um, getting into all of this, no one expected this to be managed well uh, at all. No one, uh, not uh, our, our head of states, and uh, literally no one. I think what he, where he's different to uh, to the American. Uh, leader is that he is willing to uh, look at his mistakes and willing to learn from those mistakes. And um, that has been um, incredible how he is simply um, not not shy of saying, OK, what I said last week is no longer correct because I got advice that what I thought last week was, know, was not the right decision. So it's been really, he's not been shy uh, to uh, change um, uh, certain decisions, to change certain thoughts and and get everyone together behind him um, in coming out of the bushfires where people were literally telling him, you've handled this really, really rubbish. And I think that, that kind of humbleness um, of, um, of him um, led a lot to where we are today. And the second bit, uh, so I think what is different to, um, what differentiates Australians to maybe, uh, I can say this also from, from Germans and maybe others, is that the real big um, willingness to work together and to hold together and to support each other 
and um, really to help your, your, your mates. And suddenly in Germany to be a mate, it takes a long, long time to be someone's mate. Um, here, um, someone you'd see the first time, it's immediately your mate. And I think there is this kind of really willingness to help and support. And this is where I guess this hand sanitizer, the handouts, the support in shops comes from. It's uh, incredible. And it is something that is very unique, I think, to Australia and New Zealand, that kind of willingness to work together and help each other. And that led to where we are today, that people listen to the rules. They follow the social distancing requirements. And this is why we now, I think, um, um, we have around 20 to 40 infections a day, um, which is um, still too high, but it is incredibly low compared to other countries. I have a couple of questions for you guys. Um, Warren, Karen, you're in, you're in it, being in an urban market, and somebody asked if you were, um, the Airbnb situation, um, that's really affected people here. I, has it been the same cluster in there than it's been in the US? I mean, are people, are people, are people as upset with Airbnb there as they are here? Well, it's um, it's it definitely wasn't great. Um, what uh, I, I know what the intention, I can understand what the intention was there, but it's maybe not as well thought through. Um, I think the biggest issue there is really that kind of um, lack of sort of trust. How do you, what is a booking, and when do you bank on a booking, and when can you not, and and having this kind of um, um, approach that um, they can decide um, is it cancelled or not. I don't, don't think that was great. What we did rather than fighting that, we really tried to, to replace those bookings as quickly as possible. And we've been able to do that um, um, uh, with a lot, but um, it's it's definitely something they have to really think about um, how do they uh, uh, handle that in the future and um, keep that decision with um, the the sort of either property owner or the companies. For property owner, this is income. For us, it's income. For the guests, it's exposable expense. It's it's a it doesn't it hurts, but it is not something you bank on. You you, you say okay, I travel, I I spent that money. That money is gone. You have a memory after that. But um, for for companies like us or for the property owner, it is paying bills. And if you don't have that money, you don't pay bills, and there is a domino effect after that. And that is the bit that wasn't thought through, and there's no way we can insure us for that. As a traveler, you can insure yourself for that. We cannot insure us for for this kind of um, 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 lack of income. So that's a difficult thing to solve for them, but um, yeah, I think it could have been solved uh, or handled differently um, and giving us more control of that. I have another question related to that. How are the home? How are you guys working with homeowners? So the question is, how are homeowners handling the news of being shut down for six months? How do you guide them? How do you manage their property if they if you are on shutdown? Yeah, it's very difficult. Well, what we're doing is we're over communicating with them. Mm -hmm. We're sharing as much information as we possibly can. We've created a um, a new checklist um, for them so that as soon as we are available to go, sorry, as soon as we are able to go to properties, many owners I think will attend their properties. So we've got a checklist ready for them to take to their property to make sure it's up to scratch, to make sure that, you know, everything's ready to fly if we do get the number of bookings that Pete and I and are expecting that we're going to get, um, that the properties can handle those and are set up properly. And we're just telling them absolutely everything. Um, and, you know, not, there's no secrets. No. Um, mm -hmm. In the past, we only told people what we thought that they needed to know. Um, and that philosophy has really changed during this crisis for me and my team. We're now just telling them everything. You know, and it seems to be working for us. We're getting a lot of support. We haven't lost too many owners. Like um, you said, Pete, last night, I think you said that we, um, you know, there's only a small number that are jumping ship. Most of them seem to be saying, you know, well, we'll just have to row through this um, and not have any income. And I guess we're also fortunate that it's not our summer season. Um, it's not our peak season. So, 
we, we're hoping that we'll be back by November, December and we can enjoy the benefits of the peak. Mind you, we just lost our peak in January from um, the bushfires. Oh. So, you know, we need, we need, we can't do two peaks back to back, um, would be fairly damaging. Um, but yep, over communicating, just tell them everything. We're writing to them, we're emailing them, we're calling them, we're, you know, we're doing whatever we can do to stay in contact. And I'm, you know, we have relationship managers who manage each owner and but I'm getting my entire team calling people so they're talking to people that they haven't spoken to before the bookings team are talking to owners my accounts team are talking to owners everybody's got a list of 20 owners that they need to look after and 20 properties that they need to look after and stay in contact with so we've just changed it up a little bit I have a question um for Rebecca, actually, Rebecca mentioned the government aid earlier. Are they seeing that for all businesses or just select ones? I think that's a tiny part of our problem here is that some businesses are getting approved while others have no clue where they stand in line. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if your government aided all businesses or just some. It, it, mm -hmm. it made a judgment that you must have a decreased revenue of less than of more than 30%. So, but, and, and based on your return for a, a GST perspective. So, I think they call it VAT or something. So, yeah, each return, so you have to, yeah, your income had to reduce by 30% if you're under 50 million turnover and 50% um, if you're over 50 million turnover. Um, interesting because that's doable. Yeah. First of all, it would benefit the people who actually pay their taxes, which here you know is also an issue. Yeah. And we know what they paid last year, and it's pretty easy to determine, you know, what they paid this year. Yeah, absolutely. So they're, they're, it's it's been actually really smart. The treasurers, um, and I note, um, Pete and Kieran that the treasurer is doing a webinar where you can ask questions um, via Business Australia. Um, so he's actually getting online and have, doing what we're doing now, which will be good. I'm sure, Pete, you might have some questions for him. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so the government's looking after us. Where we will survive, many of us will survive. I mean, small restaurants, cafes, if they were paying their staff wages and taking tax, they, their staff are not working and getting $750 a week. So the cafes and restaurants are shut. The retail is shut and the staff are not working. I mean, I've, I've kept my staff working, um, but they can only work the number of hours to the 750. So if, if their hourly rates $100 an hour, they can only work seven and a half hours a week. So there are some rules as far as looking after staff are concerned and hourly rates, minimum hourly rates. And that's the thing, we've had some programs passed, but nobody's getting paid yet. Like we had one- not, We're not getting paid yet either. Okay. We're not getting paid yet either, Amy. We're gonna wait until May. So we and have to pay it up front, um, which could be difficult for some people. I'd imagine if you haven't got any cash coming in and you've got no, reserves, you've got no war chest, then how do you pay the people $750 a week until you get the $750? So that's interesting, but there are government loans and, you know, government, yes. same as New Zealand, you know, there, mm. there is help out there. Brittany says she's going to Australia when all this is over. <laughs> that's New Zealand. Zealand. <laughs> An Amazing age. immigration, asylum. <laughs> Uh, in New Zealand, the wage subsidy is being paid out in 24 to 48 hours. Um, so as soon as you apply, you get your money and millions. I think they paid out six billion in like a week. It's just everything's flowing. All the money's flowing. Heather, I saw that you had your hand raised for a question. Uh, I don't see it now. There you are. I'm going to unmute you. It won't turn your webcam on, I promise. Heather, are you there? Heather? Maybe not. So I saw you had your hand raised. If you want to ask a question, just put on, just type 
just hey Amy and I'll I'll pull I'll try to unmute you again. Um so um what advice <laughs> I feel like you've given us so much advice right now. I may actually skip that question. Um let me see if I can get her again. Heather, are you there? Heather Brown. Okay. Um, sometimes tech works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> um, this, whole, this whole day has been really interesting. I mean, just from the very beginning. And I know you guys were sleeping during our first session. So Sorry. we'll let you catch up on this. I do think there's been like an interesting conversation around um, cancellation policies. And across the board, most professional companies have been pushing for rebooking for future stays. I mean, I, I do know that there are companies that caved and made that decision. And for them, they felt like they were, they were doing the right thing. And for them, they are. If it's the right thing for them, it's the right thing for them. Um, one person said it earlier. It's like, I can't justify refunding everything and then turning around and laying off 30 of my staff. Like, you know, it's um, it's kind of, it was that kind of decision for some people. But I also thought what was interesting in this was about the, the borders, that people are, the borders between countries, the borders between states are definitely getting more pronounced. Um, and I wonder if that's if that's going to change the way we travel going forward for a long time. Like I don't. Well, we have a generation of people who don't know what it's like to travel abroad in the way that we all have. Do you do you think about that or concerned about it or or is that the way we should be look, looking at things? You know, yeah. in, New, in New Zealand, we're certainly gearing up for a heavy domestic market for quite some time. Uh, international will come back, but they're saying it will be gradual and it's really going to be country by country. Uh, we're a long way, both of our countries, we're a long way away from the rest of the world. Uh, so there may be more short haul destinations that are more attractive. So Tourism New Zealand will have their work cut out, uh, attracting the international visitor back, but every country will be doing the same thing. So it will be a highly competitive market. Airlines will want to get the volumes back in all these countries. So the whole world is going to open up it's hard to see it happening immediately it will take several years to get back to the volumes that we have sure, yeah. what do you think i mean in your urban markets you probably had a lot of international travel yeah um i think for us uh, business focus wise we will not focus on international travel for for the next 12 to 18 months um but personally like 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 for me um I couldn't imagine not to travel um, uh, the world. I think, uh, I don't know, um, that's what I'm saying now. Let's listen to this in a year uh, or two. I think it all depends on how long this is really lasting and how um, how much of an impact it um, it will have. Is the vaccine going to be working? We don't know that yet. There's, if you look at the history, there are not many vaccines that um, that work 100% at the time and are developed in, in 12 months. So I'm more of a, Pessimist there with the vaccine, and um, and uh, yeah, I think it really depends. Um, there will definitely be what I can see um, a travel um, that includes social distancing or like personal or what well, physical distancing, and, um, and certain rules that you might need to be tested and and and, and strict. Um, I think the more we know about the virus, the more we know how to capture it and how to control it, and. Um, we will have to live with it, but I cannot imagine that um, that um, international travel is fully going down. Um, given that we still have um, the internet, we know how other destinations are. It's not like we're cutting each other off um, socially. We we simply uh, can't travel at the moment. But I do think we are herd animals. We we want to be together. We want to um, discover new things, and um, I don't think this will go away so easily unless we're locked down for for years. But I don't think that at the moment. Leslie, you sold your business at a fairly opportune time. Hindsight's <laughs> a, a wonderful thing. I used to be listening to you. I did predictions. Um, do you think that you'll get back in this space? Uh, I, it's been 15 years since I started the business, um, and it's been pretty full on. 
uh, I gave myself six months to just uh, take a step back and to recharge my batteries, recharge my uh, my brain and my body. Um, I'm three months into that journey. Uh, the world has changed. Uh, for those that know me, I, I, I won't sit still, um, but I'm not quite sure what phase two will look like. Um, watch the space. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca and I oh, would trust me. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Still trying to find a way to work with you. Um, Rebecca, the um, the mental health thing. There are a couple of comments that have come in since you mentioned that. That is a big deal, and it's a really big deal here. Um, we're not exactly I, saying it anyway. So yeah, I, I know I've even got it with my staff who work in an office That's together. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what I've done is we have a meeting on. Teams or Zoom every morning at 10 o'clock. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I've organised for my personal trainer to do a Zoom session for oh, wow. with all my staff. So all 22 of us get in our lycra and we <laughs> laugh and we take the piss out of each other and we do what Australians do um, during our personal training session on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Um, I... I've got a couple of staff actually who've gone, I can't do this, and I've let them go back to the office. So they have company and, um, you know, I mean, I, I don't think it's actually against the law here in Australia. I think if you have to work from your office because of technical issues, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about mental health the longer that this goes on because... You know, I don't suffer from mental health problems, but I suffer from lack of social contact, right? So I choose to go to work. And Pete and I have had this conversation because he runs a remote business and I run an office-based business. Um, I need to go to work and talk to people and socialise. And, you know, we're not taking calls from bookings, so we're not talking to bookings people. When it, it's inter it's inter interesting times. And, you know, I think that, um, yes, um, physical distancing will continue, but I hope that there is a focus on the mental health and, you know, maybe if we all just make it our, our focus to check in on our friends who are living on their own and, you know, it, it must be very difficult. And people, people are mean. Like I had a girlfriend on Facebook say that her son was coming home to live with her in the Southern Highlands. He lives in Sydney and people ripped her to shreds on Facebook because, he's not allowed to travel and you've got to stay in your own home and his own home is in Sydney yet his family, he's only 25, his family live in Barrel and he suffers from mental health issues and she said, you know, she had to delete the post on Facebook because so many people said you are breaking the law and I actually rang her to have a conversation with her about the fact that people were being so mean to her about it. So, you know, the world probably needs to consider mental health as well. Um, a little bit more. I know we're very much focused on physical health, but you know, you as we all know, if you're not healthy mentally, it's much easier to get sick physically. It's true. Yeah. It's really true. I, I think for us, you know, it's absolutely endorse everything Rebecca said. I've, I'm being shocked at, at the number of people that have, have been because I'm, a, I'm a, a very much a social beast as well and, and love that sort of thing. So I've had people calling me nonstop just saying, are you okay? You know, not being able to get out there and, and get into the world. And it's, um, so it's, it's, that's, that's certainly been a factor. I'm, and not that I'm, I'm feeling as I've got any mental health issues, but I've, I, I certainly feel, you know, suffering from that lack of social contact. And you know, I, I think that uh, I've had people calling me up just saying, look, is there anything I can do for your business? Because your business will be devastated right now, and it is. Um, you know, can I do something for you? Can I help you to rebuild your website? Can I do something just to... And so those those welfare checks that are coming in my direction are amazing and so well respected. And you know what? We're, I'm doing that as well to people that have got those restaurants and, and those those guys that, have, that I know may not come back after this because, you know, it's, it's just going to be so tough for, for those people that had knife edge businesses to, to get going again. In New Zealand, we particularly have a, a, a an amazingly empathetic leader at the moment, uh, and there is a lot of shift in the discussion on mental health, particularly as we go into the, the next phase. And yesterday they launched or they made available three uh, apps for mental health um, and have funded 
some of these companies to pivot from workplace uh, mental health focus to, to personal um, focus. So I, I think there's going to be a lot more dialogue on the mental well-being and what we can do in isolation to look after each other. There's a lot of ads running on TV and the Prime Minister said, you know, be kind. And our COVID-19 messages are, you know, look after each other, be kind, we're united together. So there has been a, I guess, a, a vein of, um, of empathy throughout the whole lockdown in New Zealand. Um, the economic side, I think, adds something, you know, to this as well. It's, you know, it's like there is the stay, the shelter in place, you know, piece of it. And then there's also the economic despair that's going along with it that I think that it's very, it's very pronounced here right now. Um, Karen, how are you taking care of yourself through this? Personally or, or like for, for the team? So I'm doing a lot of wine. <laughs> ah. <laughs> no, um, no, personally, personally. I mean, how are you? And how is this shaping you as a leader? I think it, it, it in general, I think moments like this, um, they, they do uh, help us to to grow and to evolve because it's something we've never experienced before. And you can't get out, you can't you can't hide. You have to deal with it, and it feels like this avalanche is coming towards you, and you can't run away from it. And I think um, it, it's like when you when you are uh, in a plane, um, you always put this uh, oxygen mask on yourself first, and then you you look after others. And I think that's some, some something we can forget very easily that you try to um, solve and um, rescue everything and you forget uh, yourself on that and um, I think it's important to 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 understand when you reach a, a moment like that that you need to put your oxygen mask again on um, and for me that is um, uh, simply simply doing something completely different um, like doing stuff on the house or the apartment um, uh, fixing things um, um, just going, taking breaks and uh, going out, uh, like we're allowed to go to the park here, still walk the dogs, um, doing things like that, being um, connected with um, with the team and just um, talk other things um, and um, really look at, at, at the positive things. Um, I think it's very difficult to only, uh, very easy to just see the, the dark side and the, and the difficult thing. And um, I've been joining a couple of um, uh, founder groups, entrepreneur groups where Everyone is sharing different stories, and you are not alone. And you can really, yeah, help each other. You can support each other, and uh, there is always something positive in this. Sometimes it's just difficult to see for the moment, and that's what that mental health, um, I guess, problem is: is that sometimes it can look so dark. And if you have no one around you, and you are not a social person, you might never ask other people for for help and for thoughts. And uh, I think that's something to be aware of for yourself, to not isolate yourself. Um, there is uh, an end of that, um, no matter how how difficult. Um, and um, it always looks greener on the other side than actually is uh, as well. Um, so yeah, combining all of that, um, I've uh, started, tried to stay away from alcohol <laughs> like um, at, uh, at every time. So if, um, we do some social drinking like uh, via FaceTime and stuff like that too to just chat with friends and that's actually working out quite well to uh, to do that and um, um, yeah and um, where I'm really happy with this is kind of um, how people call you like Jim uh, um, um, a pizza is like uh, people call you and say hey how are you doing and, and that's that's amazing that is um, um, making you feel uh, just good and it's important to do the same thing uh, to others and uh, I think that's a good uh, domino effect uh, to sort of start. Well, I didn't realize how late it was, so I apologize for keeping you so long. <laughs> I know that's not what that's I promised. Early. But I, yeah, I, know, I really appreciate this so much, you guys. I mean, it means a lot to me. Um, I've gotten a lot out of this. It is it is interesting. This may be the first time I remember a situation that affected our industry, that affected the whole world in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, uh, you know, like, like, for instance, you had the fire, we've got a hurricane, you know, what I mean, you've got all these different things, but um, this is such a global situation. And I don't, it, it, and it's long lasting. I, I agree with you that I think that we're in for a longer haul than we think we are. I just got to notice that one of our destinations is opening back up. 
Um, I, I haven't read it yet, but I, anyway, thank you um, so much. This is really enlightening. I hope we can do this again. We should actually do this pretty on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. We need to connect our worlds a little bit more. Um, Leslie, thank you for the idea. <laughs> I appreciate it. And um, I hope to talk to you guys very soon. Um, I miss you guys. Thank you so much. Virtual hug. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>